Do you have your Bible this morning? It's Romans chapter 9. Romans has, is a book that is not the easiest book to teach in some sense. Paul says, or Peter says, that some of the things that Paul writes about are hard to understand. And um, the book of Romans is definitely one of those books. And chapter 9 to 11 is probably one of the harder writings of Paul uh, to, to really study and and get something out of, well, chapter 9 is the chapter, it's kind of, you either spend four weeks on it, or you just kind of spend one day on it, and I decided that we would just spend one morning on chapter 9. There's almost like every phrase is a thought by itself, and uh, you kind of have to prepare the, the background to really bring out the most of it, so what we're going to do is just kind of do a general overview of chapter 9 this morning. You know, when you build a house, the foundation is not necessarily the most exciting part to build. It's underground, it's, it's, it's dirty, it's, it's not so visible, and, but the finishings are a lot more interesting. But the foundation is important, and the book of Romans does that for us. If you really have a good grasp and a good understanding of the book of Romans, you have a good foundation to build your spiritual life upon. Because the book of Romans tells us how God sees us, what his plan is for us, how God sees Israel, and how we are to live in light of that. Now we're shifting gears a little bit here in chapter 9. The first three chapters deal with the wrath of God. Chapter 4 to 8 deal with the grace of God. And chapter 9 to 11 with the plan of God and the last three chapters with the will of God. And this morning, we kind of shift a little bit from the grace of God, which we've been studying, now to the plan of God. What is God's plan? What is God's plan for Israel? What's God's plan for the church? What is God's plan for the future? Now, when Paul opens this book, he addresses three types of people. He addresses the pagan, the moralists, and the religious person. And he does something similar to all three of them. He takes a brush and he paints them all black. <laughs> he says, you're all lost. You're all sinners. And then he brings the solution. In chapter 3, chapter 6, he brings, or chapter 8, he brings the solution to that problem. That we are, that we can be saved through Christ. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins and we are justified before God through faith in Jesus Christ. The way, if you look at Paul's epistles, the way Paul writes most of his epistles is that he makes a doctoral statement in the first, say, half of the book and then he will say something like, now in light of this, this is how you are to live. Now, he does the same thing in the book of Romans. He makes a doctrinal statement, and if it were like any of the other books, he would now say, in light of this, now this is how you live. But he does something different. He inserts, like, almost like in parentheses, he, he, he inserts three chapters. And he says, let's talk about something different. Let's talk about God's plan for Israel. And how does that fit in today in, in how in the church. How does Israel and the church and the promises, are they for Israel or are they for the church? Is the church Israel? Or, and he, he kind of inserts this three chapters in between. And then he says, now in light of the doctrinal statement he made, let's, this is how we're to live. So we have kind of three chapters that kind of Paul puts in between, nestles them in between, and they're very important. In chapter 8, he ends with a high note, the grace of God. Yep, we're all painted black. We are sinners. We are lost. But because of God's grace, we have been justified. And he ends up with a good note. You know, what can separate us from the love of God? He says nothing, nor tribulation, nor, nor anything, nor death. Nothing can separate us. But then in chapter 9, when he starts talking about Israel, 
he's a little bit sad. He, he starts on a low note. Verse 1, he says, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh. And Paul is full of joy in one part, but in the other, his heart is breaking. There is a verse in Proverbs that says something that on the outward a man may be smiling, but on the inward his heart is grieving. And that's kind of how Paul feels. He's, he's excited about what Christ has done, about salvation, about justification, but on the other side, he is full of sorrow when he sees the nation of Israel. Jesus, too, was full of sorrow when he, when he was on the Mount of Olives. And he wept and he said, How often I wanted to gather your children. And he's speaking of Jerusalem. Gather them together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The Jews, for the most part, rejected their Messiah. When the veil was torn, when Jesus died on the cross, rather than turning from their sins and seeking God and seeing what does this mean, they stitched that veil back up together, hung it back in place, and they continued uh, in their old ways. And Paul says, I would be willing to forfeit my salvation if that would somehow help them bring, bring them to salvation. There's one other person that kind of did the same thing, and that was Moses. When he came down the Mount of Sinai and the people were worshiping the golden calf, remember what God said? He says, I'm angry with these people. I'm going to annihilate them. I'm going to destroy them. And I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Now, if that were one of us, we might say, good job, God, just do it. Smite him and make a nation out of me. He didn't do that. He prayed for them. And he says, forgive them. That's what, what Moses says, forgive them. But if not, I pray that you blot me out of your book as well. He was interceding. He said, I, if my uh, perdition would, would save this nation, then so be it. Paul saying the same thing. And I think that should bring a little bit of attention to ourselves, and that is, how much grief do you have? How much grief do I have over the lost? Do you grieve over lost people? Is that even a concern in your life? Paul is grieving. Jesus was grieving. Moses was grieving over those who were lost. And I think when we truly are saved and, and we grow in our walk with the Lord, we should increasingly have a burden for lost people. So he says, I wish, if possible, I would even be, you know, be accursed, if so to be, if that would somehow save Israel. And then he says in verse 4, who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption? So now he's kind of answering who they are. To them pertain the, ado the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, his overall, the eternal, blessed God. Amen. <laughs> he, Israel had it all. They had it all. They, they were adopted. When, G, when God commanded Moses to take the people out of the land of Egypt, God said to Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go, my firstborn. They're adopted. That's my nation. They're mine. They were adopted. And then Paul says here, the glory belonged to them. When they were traveling in the desert, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day, the glory, the tabernacle was with them. It wasn't with all the other pagans. It was with them, with Israel. They were adopted. The glory was well among them. The covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the land that was promised to them. They were now on their way back to the land that had been promised. It belonged to them. The law, God gave 
the law to Moses there at Mount Sinai. He came down and he gave the law, taught them to the nation. Not all the other nations, but Israel. They had him. The services of God, the service of God, that is the temple services. Their, their sins were appeased before God. They were able to sacrifice on behalf of their sins or for their sins. And they were forgiven or at least appeased until Christ came. And through him all sins were forgiven. But it was Israel who had this blessing. The promises. You know, all the promises of blessing, the promises that the whole world would be blessed through them, through the Messiah would come through them. To whom was it given? To Israel. What more? Messiah himself would come through them, through the Jew. Who is, he says here, look in the verse part, verse 4, or rather verse 5, who came, who is over all, the eternal blessed God. It's God himself. God himself is going to come through whom? Through the Jew. They were adopted. They experienced all the glory. The covenants were with them. The law was with them. All the service of God that their sins were forgiven was with them. The promises of blessing of the Messiah was with them. When he came, he wasn't just a prophet. It was God himself came from them. And now they're lost, rejected, and cursed? How is it possible? These people had everything. The other people had nothing. The Gentiles had nothing. And they had everything. And they were seeking God. And now they're all lost, or, or most of them, and going to hell. And those who didn't know anything about God, who didn't have any of the blessings, now all receive Christ and are saved? How is that possible? Is, what does that say about my salvation? If God chooses Israel and they're now lost and rejected and most of them going to hell, what does that say about my salvation? If God chose me, will I then someday also be rejected and lost and hated by God? Is that, that, that's the question that Paul is answering in this chapter. When you think about salvation, today we're living in the best time to be saved. It will never be easier to be saved than it is today. In the Old Testament, it was really true rituals. And it wasn't true forgiveness. It was just appeasement. When you, those who serve idols, they would appease their God. They would bring him rice and and some meat and something, and put, put some candles on there, hoping to appease God. In the one sense, that was what the sacrifices were. They were just appeasing God. God was kind of taking, turning, just turning a blind eye on their sins until Jesus came and forgave their sins. So it was more complicated back then. Plus, you didn't have the Holy Spirit living in you. Only select people had the Holy Spirit living in you. So it was more complicated to be saved in the Old Testament in that sense. Today is day of grace. You repent wherever you are. You receive Christ and you are saved. When Christ comes to take us out, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, after that it will be complicated to be Christian. You'll be persecuted. You may lose your life. So today is the easiest time ever in history to be saved. It's really a window, a time of grace. Jesus says, that the road is narrow, and there is few who find it. So Paul is not anticipating this question. If God chose the nation of Israel and they missed it, what does that say about God? What does it say about Israel's present position? What does it say about our position in Christ? So verse nine, or verse six, he says, "But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they're not all Israel who are." Of Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. 
at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now he begins in verse 9. He says, it's not that the word of God has no effect. In other words, it's not that when God chose Israel that it, it had no effect. God did make a, an eternal covenant with Israel, but that does not mean that they will all be saved. Many were lost, but if you look down to verse 27, he says that a remnant will be saved. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. So he's saying, when God made a covenant with Israel, don't think that they'll all be saved. In fact, it was prophesied that most of them would reject the Messiah. But there is a remnant that is saved. So he's trying to answer that question. Why is it that Israel is rejecting Jesus? And he's trying to answer that question. He says, it never, God never said just because they chose them, most of them will be saved, but a remnant will be saved. And then he says, and he's, he's answering our question here. See, the Jews thought that because they were descendants of Israel, or descendants of Abraham, they were saved. Hey, we are descendants of Abraham. Abraham is our father. That's what they said to Jesus. Abraham is our father. We are believers. We are saved. We, we. He says, no, no, no. He says, look, Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael, and he had Isaac. Both were equally his son, right? A son, Abraham has a son with, if you had checked the DNA, they're both equally Abraham's sons. Abraham, Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar. Both sons had the same amount of genes from Abraham. They're both his sons, both legitimately his sons. So how are you saying now that you are Jacob's son, and therefore you are a believer. Ishmael is also his son. They're both his sons. He says, it doesn't work that way. He says, one of them is a son of promise, but the other one is not. So he says, that means that it's not based on, it's not hereditary, it's relationship. It's not according to the flesh, because the son of Ishmael was of the flesh. The, Abraham and, and Sarah were trying to help God out. They said we were supposed to have a son and we were old and we didn't have it. So they came up with an idea. It was of the flesh. It wasn't of the spirit. So he says it's not hereditary. It is a promise. It is because one was chosen, the other one was not. It's because of relationship. Do you have that relationship? Do you have that faith in God? That is what's going to save you, not just because you are also part of the seed. Verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not being yet born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, someone might say, it's not fair that God chose Isaac over Ishmael. They were both sons. But then someone might argue, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, Ishmael was illegitimate in the sense that he was from Hagar, not his actual wife. So, yeah, maybe some reason why God did that. But then he comes with another argument. He says, well, if that is the case, we might understand that God would not choose Ishmael for that reason. But then how about Jacob and Esau? They were both legitimate. They were both from Isaac, from the seed of Abraham, and from Sarah, and so, and his wife, Rebecca, so they were both legit. And now she's pregnant, and there's two babies inside of her. They're both legit. And they've never done anything wrong. They've never done anything good. They're just babies. And God says, I hate one, and I love the other. You say, that's not fair. How is it possible? 
there was a student that came to a professor and he says, I have a problem with that verse. He says, how come, how, how can God hate one before he's done anything good or bad? The professor said, I, I also have a problem with that verse. But he says, my problem is not why did God hate Esau. He says, my problem is why did God love Jacob? So we might say, in verse 14, he says, the first part, he says, what shall we say then? In other words, is God unfair? That is how our human mind reasons, right? This is not right. Let's continue reading. Is there any unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say then to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him, Who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor, the other for dishonor? So Paul says, God, the answer, why God hates Esau and loves Jacob is that God chooses to have mercy on whom he wills and to have compassion on whom he wills. This world is God's world. He created it. And he made people. All of them. Adam and Eve, he made you, he made us all. And he gets to choose. It's his gig. Just like the potter and the clay. The clay is there. The potter sits down and he starts making a pot. He has, it's his choice. He can make the type of pot he wants. He can make one. He can make a, a latrine if he wants. Or he can make some perfume vessel. It's his choice. It's his gate. The clay is his. How can the clay say, you, not, you can't make a latrine for me? Tough luck. It's his choice. He says here to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now it says here, if you just by reading it, it would almost seem like God prepared Pharaoh for this work and then he hardened him. That's not what it says. Um, it says he raised him up and he allowed him, in other words, God divinely allowed him to occupy this position. But if we read the story carefully, we know that Pharaoh hardened his heart first. And after hardening his heart a number of times, then God says, and then God hardened his heart. In other words, God confirmed the decisions that Pharaoh had already made. See, God does not go around in involuntarily hardening the hearts of people. But God doesn't do that. If a person says, I will not repent, I will not get saved, God respects that choice and ultimately he confirms that choice. Let's read verse 22. What if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Notice that, prepared for destruction and prepared for glory. Even us, verse 24, whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So God can make his power known through those prepared for destruction and those prepared for mercy. God can show his power through an unbeliever, like Pharaoh. 
or even like Nebuchadnezzar. God says in Jeremiah 27, verse 6, he says, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. And he was a wicked king. And he came and he took Israel and he took him captive. He slew many of the people. And he says, you know, that is my servant. God can use a wicked person to accomplish his will. He says here, vessels prepared for mercy and vessels prepared for destruction. Now, God does not prepare a vessel for destruction per se. It's not that God preordains this person to be destroyed and he prepares him for destruction. No, the vessel oftentimes, or can do, a good job of itself to destroy itself. God doesn't do that. It's this, the vessel itself is prepared for destruction. The vessel prepares itself for destruction. God made humanity holy and he made humanity righteous. That's how God ordained it. And he gave Adam and Eve free choice. He gave Adam and Eve free choice. And what did they choose? They chose to eat of the forbidden fruit and to fall. That was a choice that was made by Adam and Eve. Today, we can still see the beauty of God through creation, but it is marred. It is marred by sin. And God picks out of that marred humanity, that sinful humanity, certain ones to whom he will show mercy. The question is, which ones? We don't know. But God knows, for he has foreknowledge. God knows everything in advance. God knows what our choice will be, and he holds us responsible to that choice. We'll get back to that just a little bit more a bit later. I know I'm leaving you hanging a little bit here, but I'll come back to that, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Verse 25, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved, who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Now Paul here is speaking of the restoration of Israel. During the millennium, there is going to be a coming time when Israel will be restored back into their, They are restored back into their land. But when Christ is going to come back and he's going to be the shepherd and he's going to shepherd them during the millennium and they'll be restored to something. That's what Paul is talking about here. They will be once again called the sons of the living God. They'll be restored. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. So he says here, a remnant will be saved. God saved a remnant during the Babylonian captivity. There was a remnant that came back. They were saved. Many of them never came back. Most of them did not come back into the land, but some did. There's a remnant. During the tribulation, God is going to save a remnant. 144,000 Jews, 12,000 of each tribe will be saved. A remnant will be saved. Many will die, but a remnant will be saved during that time. And then he says, if God had not shut, cut short that time. It says here, verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut short. What does that mean? In Matthew 24, Jesus says, if the time had not been cut short, no man would be saved. It speaks of the time of the tribulation. If you read in Revelation, you read of the tribulation, you see that in just the first couple of plagues, 30% of the population is dead on the earth. By the time the seven years have elapsed, probably at least 75% of population has died in a period of seven years. If Christ had, if this tribulation would have been ongoing in a longer period of time, no man would be saved. They would all be lost. They would, they would have all died. But God is going to cut it short. It will only be seven years. Verse 29. And Isaiah has said before, unless the Lord... Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. 
What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness? Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So we have two classes of people, the Gentiles, who did not follow after any moral code, but now have come to faith, and the Jews who tried to attain righteousness by keeping the law, but they missed it. So, coming back to the question that we had, and I kind of left you hanging, why is it that God elects this group of people, and most are lost, that is the Jews, is God not capable of saving them? Well, as I said before, God did not say that they would all be saved, only a remnant. It was prophesied that most of them would reject Messiah. But then the question back to the sovereignty of God and the will of man. This has troubled man ever since. And Paul here in this chapter is addressing it. Why is it that God has mercy on some and God does not have mercy on others? Why is it that some vessels are prepared for mercy and others for destruction? Why is it that God chose Jacob but not Esau? Why is it that God said Isaac is the son of covenant but not Ishmael? In our minds, we would say it's not fair. We would say, first wait, let the person grow up, see what kind of decisions he'll make, and then we will make a choice. But God makes his decisions based on foreknowledge. If you had a, a horse race and there would be 10 horses on the racetrack and you would all make a bet which horse would win. But you had absolute foreknowledge. You knew everything. You knew how the horses would be running. You knew which horse would stumble. And you know which one wins. Which one would you choose? Do it, the one that wins. God knows before the foundations of the earth were laid, he knows every single detail of your life. He knows exactly what you will choose. He knows what you will reject. He knows that and he chooses based on foreknowledge. There are those who say that there is a sovereignty of God. That means that God chose people before the foundations of the earth were laid. So, People can't do anything about it. You just kind of lift up your hands. Hey, God, if I'm chosen, you've got to save me. And if not, well, I'm just lost. No, that, that's, not, that's not, not what the Bible teaches. I want you to notice in verse 14 to 18, Paul points out the sovereignty of God. If you look at verse 14 to 18, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? In other words, is God choosing one, not the other? Verse 15, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Um, verse 17, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Now, it would seem that God, in his sovereignty, he hardens some and he shows mercy to some and he destroys others. It's like, it's just a, it's the sovereignty of God. We have no choice. We have no saying. But then look in verse 30, 32. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness even the righteousness of faith, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because, now listen to this, they did not seek it by faith, as it were, by works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They did, here's the, here's the answer, they did not seek it by faith. That is why. 
They're rejected. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. This remnant is saved. Why? Because they sought it by faith. They're, they had a choice. Yeah, but, but God says that, that he chose some and he hardened some. Yeah, but it says that they pursued. So we see that both are true. Someone might say, this is not fair. How come God gets to choose? <clears throat> Maybe I'm not chosen. Well, then receive Christ and you will know. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. Well, the person might say, well, I don't want to. Well, then maybe you're not chosen. Well, that's not fair. Well, then receive Christ. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, but I don't want to live for God. I don't want to live for God. Well, then maybe you're not chosen. And it just goes around in circles and circles. There is such a thing as the sovereignty of God. Not all things are left to cause and effect. Not all things are left to cause and effect. In other words, what goes on in your life, it's not all cause and effect. If I walk off this building, I'm going to fall and I'm going to break myself. That's cause and effect. But there are times when God causes you to walk off this building and break yourself. That can also happen. God brings certain things into your life sovereignly in order for you to be refined and reformed. It may be that God at certain times withholds something to you or makes you blind to certain things and you stumble through it and you come out on the other side and it's like, what just happened? And it is a natural event that God supernaturally intervenes in, a, in, in, in such a way as to refine you. There, it's not, or life is not just left by chance, cause and effect. There is the sovereignty of God where he intervenes and certain things happen to our lives because God preordained it. But then there's also the will of God and the will of man where whosoever will let him come. There is that responsibility of men. We will never fully understand the selection of men and man's free choice. We are limited in nature. God is not. It's just not possible for us to grasp. We can't. We are, we are we're human. Someone has said, if we try to explain it away, we might lose our soul. These truths must be held in tension like a suspension bridge, right? You go to Kyle, you have that suspension bridge. There's a post on every side, both sides. And you might argue until you're just, you lost your soul. Which post is it? Is it this post or is it that post? It's both. It's both. And they're both planted in the ground and they're both foundational and they're both pulling against each other in tension and the bridge holds up. And, and that is the sovereignty of God and the will of man is the same. They're both true at the same time. For us as humans, we don't understand it. We don't grasp it. We don't know how that works exactly. We can make some examples like God preordains by foreknowledge. Um, but it doesn't really completely satisfy it. It's, it's not a complete answer. Or we can use illustration like horses. You know, you, you have the foreknowledge of which horse wins. But it's not completely, it doesn't satisfy the, the, the answer to the sovereignty of God because there are certain things that God sovereignly plants into your life, certain experiences, and certain events that you experience that God sovereignly allows. It's not, we're not left to cause and effect. But then how does that, how does that affect my decision making? I don't know. I don't know that it, we, we can argue until we're blue and lose our soul. We don't know. We just don't know. But we do know that somehow in the midst of that, God has given man a choice. He holds people responsible for their decisions. 
He held Adam and Eve responsible for their decisions. So this is something that we can be troubled by. But I don't think we have to. I think we can just rely on the fact that God is sovereign and that he has created the heavens and the earth. He has created you and that somehow in it you have a choice. You can choose to respond or you can choose to refuse. Remember the, the disciples, they were following him and then the 70 followed him and, and they were driving out demons. It was great. And then one day Jesus has a really hard teaching. He comes in and says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. It was a hard teaching. Really what Jesus was teaching, he was teaching commitment. He says, don't follow me because I turn water to wine and I make food and, and I still the storms. And it's kind of like entertaining me, kind of like, a, like, a, like watching TV. Like, I wonder what's going to be next. And it's just a, like, follow him for entertainment. Purpose. Jesus says, no, no, no. He says, you eat my flesh and you drink my blood. In other words, I'm your life. You follow me with all of it. Or don't follow me. And most turned and they left. And then Jesus says to the twelve, you too, are you going to leave me too? Are, are, do you want? And Peter says no. He says we're going to stay committed to you because you have the words of life. In other words, we're going to eat your flesh. We're going to, eat your, we're going to be committed to you. It was a choice. Jesus gave people a choice. Jesus gives you a choice. Somehow interwoven with, with, with the sovereignty of God is that part. The selection of God is the aspect that we can choose. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust you. Chapter 9 is a, a, a chapter that can be a bit, a bit rough to understand. And it's it's kind of a lot for us sometimes to really grasp all of it. But I pray that you would help us. That it would just be another building block in our foundation. To realize what a sovereign and what an awesome God we serve. That he has a plan. He didn't just swing this world into, into existence and then he kind of went for a walk. No, he, he, he knows very intimately. He's very intimately aware of each one here this morning. He knows the hair on our head. He knows every detail of our life. He's woven us together in our mother's womb, the Bible says. And he says in Ephesians, he preordained work for us that we should walk in it. And then you give us a choice as well. So we just thank you, Lord, for we just accept it by faith. And we ask, Lord, that you would teach us and continue to help us to grow in our walk with Christ. In Jesus' name.